All right, well, I'm here to tell, talk to you tonight about the technology that divides us, but I think we can all agree that Merck Collective deserves another round of applause for that wonderful, uh, <laughs> wonderful musical interview. Thank you. Thank you. So as we survey the landscape of issues facing the world, COVID, we realize that political polarization is not just an ideological batter, battle or a cultural battle. It's become also an existential battle. Not just for COVID and maybe more importantly, if we're looking at Libya last week, uh, climate change, right? There's any number of issues that can't wait for people to work together. And the one that's maybe most concerning, cocktails. Even cocktails. It's a good thing someone got me a drink. So you're probably here today because many of you believe, like I did, that technology is the key driver of polarization. And I would love to come up here and tell you that Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or any of the other um, combative billionaires that control our platforms have a switch that they could throw that could magically transform everything tomorrow. But I can't. You're a sophisticated audience. This is science in cocktails, not science in beer. <laughs> so we're going to get into it tonight. And I'm going to share with you what I've learned on a journey over the last 15 years studying political extremism on social media. I'm going to talk about how we got here. I'm going to talk about where we are headed. And most importantly, I want to talk about what we can do, how we can reshape the future of social media. This is a dark topic, but I'm going to bring some optimism tonight. Um, I'm going to argue new forms of technology, a new field, computational social science, may be uniquely qualified to help us reverse course and create a more productive public discourse. So three years ago, I joined a blue chip group of social scientists who were trying to diagnose the key drivers of political polarization. We got together, we came up with a list, social media was like number three or number four, there was other stuff. Another cocktail reference here. Um, but, you know, the thing that stood out to us was not so much that people disagree. People in my country, America, have disagreed about things like gun control, abortion, any number of issues for a long time. But what startled us is when we looked at something called affective polarization. This is what people of different political groups think of each other, independent of their ideas. And somewhere around 2012, something pretty disturbing happened, and that is that the tendency for people to hate or dislike the other side outpaced their love or approval for their own side. And this trend has been getting worse since 2012, and many people will say, well, social media really took off around 2012, right? Like, this is the kind of heyday of, of Facebook, when it was going to connect the world and Twitter was going to serve the public conversation. Remember that? Um, CC Elon Musk. Um, and if you're wondering if this is just a uniquely American problem, it's not. Um, many of my examples will be from the US tonight, but out of appreciation for this wonderful crowd, um, I'll be sharing some examples from, from really around the world, around the world's developed democracies. And we'll see that in many countries, Switzerland, France, yes, Denmark, um, Canada and New Zealand are all experiencing an increase in affective polarization. There are some exceptions, but overall, this trend seems to be going on in many different places. So around 2016, I was up late at night, having just heroically put my kids to bed, and I was watching the election results 
roll-in from the 2016 presidential election. Everyone in my left-leaning college professor Twitter feed was already doing a proverbial victory lap about the apparent success of Hillary Clinton. It seemed inevitable. The pollsters had it at 99%. All of us just thought it was a, a done deal. Right? And of course, the morning after, there was a lot of you know, stock taking, a lot of blame going around. And many of us, myself included, thought, wow, I am really in a filter bubble. I'm stuck in a system that reinforces my pre-existing beliefs. I'm only connected to people who already agree with me. And surely I just would have understood that large numbers of Americans really respected and were excited about this guy, Donald Trump. And, you know, had I only popped my filter bubble, I might have seen this. Similar things may have happened around Brexit, right? All of us thought that wasn't going to happen. Whoops, um, you know. The filter bubble is a really strong story. And if you look at these graphs, you'll see each node, each circle, is a Twitter user. And if they're red, they're associated with the Republican Party. Blue is Democrat. And you'll see no matter which group we look at, advocacy groups, politicians, journalists, everybody seems to be only connected to their side. And one could argue, well, this is what people do. Right? We surround ourselves with like-minded others. It's a human tendency. It's axiomatic in the social sciences that we tend to surround ourselves with people who already agree with us. But the concern with the idea of filter bubbles is that this is being algorithmically reinforced. That is, that Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever platform you use, has learned our preferences and gives us more of the, more of the same. So with the hubris of a young academic, I set out with some colleagues at Duke University, where I'm a professor, and founded the Polarization Lab. And our idea was pretty simple. We're going to pop this filter bubble. We think, alongside many tech luminaries, among them Jack Dorsey, Twitter founder, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO, and any number of politicians in the United States and Europe, and all over Brussels. This seemed to be the prime suspect. This is the reason why we're all so divided. And if we could only pop the filter bubble, we might be able to take off our partisan identities for a brief moment and empathize with each other and humanize each other. And if you know social psychology, you know that there's many studies going back half a century which suggests that intergroup prejudices can be powerfully reproduced if we simply experience each other, if we humanize each other, if we're able to have real-life experiences that contradict the prejudices that tend to grow in the absence of group contact. And so maybe, just maybe, instead of being societies just sort of moving along different directions, we can bring people back together. We can pop the filter bubble. Or maybe our experiment portended the singularly most stupid moment of social media ever. <laughs> option A, option B, I don't know. Again, I need the drink. So this is actually a pretty challenging problem to study. We talk a lot about how our social media networks are shaping our political views, right? I saw that same message about Hillary Clinton, other people saw the same message about Donald Trump, and lo and behold, this explains our different opinions. But it's also the case that we assemble our social networks according to our political views. So I choose who to follow, they already agree with me. And so if I observe people who are in an echo chamber, all having the same opinion, I can't know if that's the effect of social media or the human tendency to attach with like-minded people. And so what we really need to figure this out, my colleagues and I concluded, was an experiment. Ideally, a field experiment, an experiment in the real world where we can randomize people to either experience their filter bubble being popped or remain safely inside their echo chamber. And so in October 2017, my colleagues and I recorded, recruited about 1,600 
Republicans and Democrats who regularly used Twitter and were over age 18, and they were US citizens. No independents, just Republicans and Democrats. And we offered half of them up to $24 if they were willing to follow a bot that we told them would expose them to 24 messages a day. And we didn't tell them what the messages were going to be. In fact, when the experiment began, we just showed them beautiful vistas of the Swiss Alps and you know, lots of cats and really nice stuff, right? And gradually turned up the dial of out-partisan content. So if you were a Democrat in our, experience, in our experiment, you gradually began to see more and more tweets or messages from Republicans. Now, these were elected officials, like a Donald Trump, but also journalists, also advocacy organizations, any kind of high-profile Twitter account. I'll say a little bit more about how we chose who to show people in a minute. And conversely, if you were a Republican, you not only saw Democratic elected officials like Hillary Clinton, but you also saw advocacy groups, you know, advocating for uh, birth control access, or uh, CNN, a left-leaning media station. And for one very long month, people experienced their filter be bubble being popped. And at the end of the month, we surveyed people, we asked them the same exact questions that we asked them at the beginning of the month, and we measured all sorts of stuff. We measured what they think of, about the other side. We measured their attitudes on many, many different issues. And we thought this would tell us what happens when you pop the echo chamber. So what were these bots, and how did we create them? One of the really exciting things about this moment in social science is we've never had so much data, and we've never had so much computing power. And now with AI and generative AI, which I'll talk about towards the end of the talk, we have even more powerful tools to embed experiments in real-life settings. Carefully designed ethical experiments, but importantly, we can pull the levers of causal inference in ways that we never could before. So what we did is we found the Twitter handles of every elected official in the United States. We then scraped the names of all of the people who those people follow. And, you know, so this is, you know, Donald Trump may follow Fox News. Um, Bernie Sanders may follow um, Planned Parenthood, a birth control advocacy group. You know, but Bernie sort of also follows Hillary Clinton's niece, and she's not really that important. So we also had to prune the network to only include people who were followed by at least 10 elected officials. That produced this network, which is now familiar to you, I hope, the red with the red, the blue with the blue. But there's variants there. And some people are sort of what you could call purple. They're in the middle. They are genuinely connected to both sides. And using a variety of machine learning tools, we were able to create a continuum and place each user on a continuum that runs from left to right. Each hour, our liberal and conservative bots would draw one name from their side of the ideological spectrum and show it to that user. So we didn't determine what people would see. In fact, it was a little scary, right? This was 2017 America, so you, we all know it got worse, but 2017 was still pretty bad in terms of the crazy stuff people were seeing on social media. But anyways, we didn't want to intervene because we wanted to genuinely be what would happen if you popped the filter bubble. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in this experiment. You know, you signed up for the Swiss Alps, the cute cats, right? you did not know, you, did, you didn't know what you're going to see. But all of a sudden, you're seeing a lot of outpartisan content. You may say, Professor Bale, why don't they just leave the study? And how would you even know? Right? This is one of the challenges of studying people. Right? Unlike particles, people think, right? and we have to control their, their right, their ethical right, to remove themselves from experiments if they so choose. So we incentivize them to stay in the experiment, by asking them if they could identify one of these truly adorable creatures that my daughter helped me identify. Um, and every week, we'd show them a different cute animal once a day. And at the end of the week, if they could, if they could correctly identify the adorable creature, we, we considered them as treated, as having experienced our treatment. 
So we also asked them a bunch of questions about what the tweet said and, and, and sort of gauged pretty carefully how much people saw. So remember, the whole idea here is we're popping the filter bubble. We're hoping that that creates the, the meaningful human connection where people realize that there's maybe two sides to every story, that they've been fed the same story, that there should be a genuine competition of ideas, right? that any number of democratic theorists would say is essential to the fabric of democracy. But when we ran the numbers, we were shocked. In fact, we spent three days because we thought we had a coding error. What we found out is the more people paid attention to our bots, the more they were able to correctly identify those truly adorable creatures, uh, the more partisan they got. So the Democrats did not move towards the middle, and the Republicans did not move towards the middle. Instead, the Democrats moved slightly to the left, and the Republicans moved more to the right than they had in 10 years of public opinion polling through one simple month of exposure to journalists, elected officials, and other high-profile public opinion leaders who were Democrats. So maybe this helps explain the current truly stupid moment in, in social media. OK. We threw everything we had at this data. We have some of the top minds in statistical science, computer science, machine learning, electrical engineering, physics, you name it. We had collected, we thought at the time, more data about the filter bubble, hundreds and millions of data points, dynamic slices of each individual's network every single day, multiple waves of survey data. We had even, we thought, measured how much they looked at the stuff. We threw every machining learning machine learning tool at these data that we could. And we came up completely empty-handed. We had no idea what happened. And if you're called the polarization lab, that's really bad for business, right? You're supposed to have some solutions. So, so we got back on it, and we began to ask this question, why? And, you know, we tend to approach problems through the lens of data science, right? It's clean, it's hygienic, it's powerful, Right? AI is sort of, if, if you believe the media, sort of all-knowing and can find patterns that we humans are ill-equipped to identify. But we realized, you know, we really need to see this process from the perspective of the people who are experiencing it. We need to see how people actually change their minds. So what we did is we re-ran the whole experiment, but this time, instead of asking them to do an online survey, where they relatively anonymously shared their views about a bunch of topics, we talked to them for two or three hours before and after they experienced the treatment. Another experiment, we can compare the stories of people in the experiment and outside the experiment. But this time, instead of one point in data, we can tell you stories. And to summarize a lot of our results, I'll share with you the story of a woman who we call Patty to protect her identity. Now, if you remember the media narrative about the rise of Donald Trump, and there's similar parallels here in Europe about the rise of populism, and how the victims of inequality were uniquely vulnerable to the populist rhetoric of insurgents who sort of tried to turn the system on its head. We've all heard this story, right? And when I scanned our interview data, and thought, who is the person who is most likely to be seduced by the rhetoric of someone like Donald Trump? I thought it was Patty. Patty is a 64-year-old woman. She lives in a barn that looks like this in a rural area of New York, far away from New York City. Sort of infamous for having pretty conservative views. And when we first met Patty, the first thing that was immediately clear is she hated politics. She didn't want anything to do with it. She went to science and beers, not science and cocktails, right? No judgment, no judgment. Um, but really, Patty is like most people, right? More people can identify the striker on their football team than their representative in the European Parliament, right? 
I'd be surprised if many of you can identify your European Parliament representative. That's another matter. Okay. So Patty is like most people. She doesn't like politics. And we began, like we did in all our interviews, asking her a series of questions. You know, so tell us about yourself. Why did you start using social media? We went through, you know, she joined social media sites like Twitter in order to follow her favorite celebrities. You know, TV shows, pretty mundane stuff. And she didn't mention politics at all. We didn't push it, we let her tell her story. And eventually we bring up the political issue. And she says, well, you know, I don't really care for Fox News, the conservative uh, television station that we all, we all know. But you know, I really don't like CNN either, the liberal counterpart. She says, you know, like, these people, they're just out to, out to get money. You know, they don't care about you know, normal people like me. When we forced her, we said, you know, we didn't force her, we asked her politely, right? But if you had to vote for one, she reluctantly says, I guess I'd vote for the Democrats. Then we began to probe deeper into her opinions about individual issues. She was concerned that immigrants represented a cultural threat to the United States. She was concerned that government taxes too much. She was worried that benefits were being directed towards undeserving people instead of her. It's a familiar narrative, right? Not just in the United States, but all over Western Europe, right? A, a narrative that I thought would make her, again, uniquely susceptible to the populism of someone like Donald Trump. So over time, we gradually turn up the volume of Republicans in Patty's feed. And you know, at first, she's just sort of like repulsed and says, like, I, you know, I don't want to. Oh, more cats, please, less of this, you know, more adorable creatures. And we say, okay, but you know, like, let's start to talk about some of these posts. And gradually, it becomes clear that Patty has never really actually learned what Democrats do. She doesn't really have a horse in the race, but all of a sudden, she's seeing all of these Republicans you know, toxically attacking Democrats again and again and again. Even though we had sampled from a diverse group of people, we didn't just show her the most extreme people, we showed her everybody, even moderates, she began to develop an identity. By the end of the month, she was arguing about politics online for the first time. She was articulating liberal talking points about, for example, constructing a wall at the US-Mexico border. She had, in other words, learned a political persuasion. And this is in stark contrast to the world that Elon Musk sees, or Mark Zuckerberg sees, or Jack Dorsey saw years ago, where social media is supposed to be about a competition of ideas, right? So if I expose you to some new kind of message, like we did in our experiment, it's supposed to provoke introspection and reappraisal of one's priors about the world, right? You're supposed to think, I might be wrong, they have a good point, you know, let's all go get a beer. Cocktail. That's not what we saw, right? In fact, everyone we interviewed, we asked them, do you think anything you say on social media ever convinces anybody's mind, ever, ever changes anybody's mind? The answer was a resounding no, right? But everybody, most people in this population, who are politically inclined, every night, you know, doing battle with some random person, right? Why? I think that we've been using the wrong analogy. It's not an echo chamber. It's not a competition of ideas. It's a competition of identities. And we're exposed to partisan attacks, to attacks upon our group's identity. It doesn't provoke introspection and reappraisal. It forces us to choose sides. It gives us the need to elaborate our identity, and it leads to more polarization. And this begs deeper questions about why we all use social media. Yes, cute cats. But, but why do we argue with strangers? Why do we stay up late at night? Why can't we put the phone down? What is it that we're addicted to? And you've no doubt heard stories about how Silicon Valley has hacked our brains and created you know, an addictive technology that we cannot resist. And there's some merit in that. 
But after studying this for 15 years and doing dozens of studies and experiments, I've concluded that it's not a simple dopamine effect of seeing flashy things or seeing controversy. We are addicted to learning about what other people think about us. And if you think about it, this is the most human thing of all. This is what distinguishes us from other creatures, right? We just can't stop thinking from a very young age what other people think about us. You could call it social learning, you could call it the looking glass self, but the analogy is that all of us are trained to look for cues in our environment. For example, nobody has thrown tomatoes yet, so I know I'm doing okay, right? It could be worse. Um, and a few people are laughing. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm mildly funny. Okay, great. But, but I'm constantly searching the environment, and I can look in your eyes, and I can see what you all are doing. But social media has profoundly changed the way that we construct our identities. I can be virtually anyone on social media, on some platforms, right? And not only do I have more flexibility to define my identity, but I have new tools for monitoring my social environment. I have like counts, I have follow counts, I have a whole suite of new technologies that allow me, many people think, to efficiently monitor the social landscape, for cues about which identities give you social status. Because in the end, what motivates us is not being you know, exposed to a diversity of ideas, not most people anyways, not the beer drinker, not the cocktail drinkers, the beer drinkers. Um, what motivates us is status, right? We all want to fit in. And so if I can introduce a new analogy, it's that we want to use social media like a mirror here. We want to hold it up to the world and say, this is where I fit in. But in reality, social media is more like a prism, refracting certain parts of our landscape to, our, to ourselves and muting or modifying others. So for example, if you visit my social media feed, you'll note that I've cultivated this far more hip persona. Um, much, much cooler. And when I get home, I will Photoshop Taylor Swift into this picture, and my daughter will think I'm a lot cooler. And that's all well and good. But we also have to remember that these same incentives to fit in, to find status, motivate some of the worst among us. So now I'm going to tell you another story from our interviews. And this is the story of Ray. When you meet this guy, he's like the nicest guy. Lives with his mom, you know, gets, says he gets along with everyone. He's sort of a moderate Republican, but he says, you know, Dad always said, don't talk about politics or religion. But fast forward six hours, and this guy is the biggest troll on the internet. In 15 years, of studying social media. I've never seen a bigger troll. Every single night, he is meticulously photoshopping memes, placing liberal leaders like Barack Obama, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and others in the most vile ways that I don't even want to talk about. They're so terrible. And so the question becomes, what motivates someone like this? Why? The guy has like 20 followers, right? Nobody's really listening. Maybe 25, right? Um, you know, he's talking to these, you know, officials who could care less, right? Why is he doing this? Why does he turn from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde every night? And when we got to know Ray more, and we got to probe into his life a little more, what we discovered is he is a very lonely, sad man who lacks status in his offline life. He's a conservative man who works in a liberal industry, he is surrounded by liberals in his city. He's been completely shut off from the dating scene, a big problem in the US, by the way, new research showing that cross-party dating is exceptionally rare. Um, and, uh, you know, he's living with his mom. Like, things aren't good for Ray. But every night, that one extra follower, those two extra lights, it's an alternative reality for Ray. It's providing him with a much-needed sense of status and belonging. And what we see when we 
look at extremists, not just Ray, and there's counterparts, there's liberal Rays, there's other people just like Ray who live in, for example, very conservative parts of the United States. And when we see, you know, there's a common theme amongst all of them, and that is that online they're getting something that they're not getting off. So how many people are like Ray? This is where things got really interesting. We were able to pull up all political tweets. And what we saw is just about 6% of people make up 20% of all tweets, and 73% of tweets mentioning national politics. That number might now be as high as 93%. Who are these people, right? Well, 55% of that 6% of people identify as either extremely liberal or extremely conservative. But they only represent about 6% of the population. So when we think about the real estate of political discourse on social media, we realize that this tiny minority is taking up almost all of it. This is not super new news, right? We all know that trolls are having a heyday on social media these days. But now imagine that you are not the learned cocktail drinker who understands the social media prism and its power to distort reality, right? And instead, you're wandering onto social media, you're talking about a football game, you're having a heck of a time, and all of a sudden, you know, someone from the other party threatens to shoot you, right? You think, I'm, you think this might be a hyperbole, but it's, I'll tell you a story in just a minute. It's not. The number one reason people are harassed online in the United States is for sharing their political opinion. So this happens to nearly everybody. And what this creates is a situation that social scientists like to call false polarization. So even before social media, right? We were polarized before social media, especially in the United States, also other countries. And we know from early survey experiments, if you ask people, what do you think the other side thinks about an issue? Um, we all, all of us, almost all of us, exaggerate how extreme the other side is and underestimate how extreme our side is. And what this creates is this sort of winnowing out of the middle, right? All that's left is the extremes, and we can, most importantly, misunderstand everyone else as far more polarized than they really are. So mass media, you know, shapes this problem. We know that if people watch more Fox News, they become more partisan for maybe this reason. But social media has set this into hyperdrive, right? Because anyone, anywhere in this 6% of people can totally dominate the discourse just by saying something crazier than the previous person. So by now, you may be thinking, okay, sure, there's a bunch of, you know, toxic people on social media, a small group of people dominating things. Um, but I'm not that way. Most of the people I know aren't that way. You know, Where's everybody else? Where are the missing moderates? And this is one of the most pernicious effects of the social media prism. I'll tell you now the story of a woman who we call Sarah Rendon in this book. And she's interesting. She's a moderate conservative woman. She grew up in New York City. She's half Puerto Rican, half Jewish. And her father was a police officer. And because of her father's frequent uh, dangerous you know, experiences, um, she became a strong proponent of defending the police and people's rights to own guns. But she went to an elite liberal college. She reads liberal newspapers like The New Yorker and The New York Times. Most of her friends are liberal. And even though she has conservative views, she has what I argue are enormously productive views right? She can understand the plight of racial minorities to some extent, having suffered racial discrimination herself. But she can also understand the tenuous situation of, of law enforcement and police. But you will never, ever hear her talk about this on social media. Why? Well, we asked her that question. And she told us this story. She said, it was a Tuesday night, 
I had just gotten my kids to sleep. I was reading through Twitter, and someone put up a post about the National Rifle Association, which is the advocacy group for handgun ownership in the US. And, you know, she noticed a lot of liberals were sort of piling on and saying, this is a ridiculous group, you know, what are, what are you doing? And she said something pretty innocuous in the landscape of America's gun debate, which is, um, it's everybody's, every American's right to own a gun, even if you don't like it, right? Within two minutes, she had received three death threats from liberal Twitter users, or maybe Russian bots, or whoever else, right? But um, within three minutes. Now, I'd like to tell you this is the only death, sh death threat she's received for sharing her relatively moderate conservative views, but it was actually the third. And this is the one that made her run away from the platforms and stop using them altogether. So here's the nature of the problem. The reality of social media is you've got a ton of moderate people who have important, possibly productive things to say about the issues we've been talking about tonight, climate change, um, race and ethnicity and policing and immigration, and yet, what we see and what we perceive is very different, right? We see a preponderance of extreme people on both sides. Now, this is no doubt divin driven by a choice, somewhat arbitrary choice, I would argue, by social media companies some 15 years ago. Remember, you know, and it's easy to forget because people like, you know, Jack Dorsey like to say that Twitter was serving the public conversation, and Facebook was connecting the world, and Google was not being evil, right? We have this sort of idea that there's high-minded principles that drive these companies. But if you look at the origin story of every major platform right now, what you see is they were designed for the sophomoric, even silly needs of small parts of the internet. Right? Facebook famously evolved out of a platform designed to help people rate each other's physical attractiveness. Instagram, a lot of people don't know, Instagram was originally designed to facilitate alcohol-based gatherings. It used to be called bourbon. Um, TikTok, I'm not even going to go there. I don't know. Um, but let's just say it was not designed to serve the needs of democracy in 2023, right? And with that came an ad hoc evolution into democracy's public sphere. I don't think we can say that social media is not the public sphere anymore now that half the world's population is using social media, right? And those of you in the crowd who might like to say, well, we all need to get off social media, right? You know, go back to sending each other messages via carrier, carrier pigeon or something like that, right? Yeah, that sounds great, right? Except it's not going to happen. Right? If you look at young people and the level of involvement in social media and how much of their lives occurs online, it's just not tangible. So, we then got an advertising business model, right? If you say something crazy, it gets more engagement. And if you've designed a platform dependent upon advertising, the only thing you care about is as many people seeing a message as possible. So we optimize for the viral diffusion of messages. And we do that by counting how many times people comment, like, view, engage with a message, right? But there's no value system imbued in this process, right? If you say something very toxic to a very toxic post, someone else's post, right? That's not taken into account. In fact, that probably amplifies the toxic post even more, right? If you view, you know, the dumpster fire continuing to burn, you're saying with your thumb, more of this, please, right? Even if you don't realize it. And so when we start to talk about solutions, and how to break the social media prism, we would do well to start to think about alternatives. So on the left here, we have engagement-based ranking. That's the tool that almost every social media platform uses. But what if we, instead of optimizing for toxicity, which is what we're doing right now, what if we optimized for consensus? Instead of boosting the posts that get the most comments, regardless of whether they are positive or productive, what if we boost the content that people across social divides agree is useful or important? This is something we call 
bridging-based ranking in the polarization lab. And the idea here is that technology could optimize for consensus, could actually make people find out what people different than them like, right? We're addicted to social media maybe because of this hum tendency to monitor our environment, right? What better way to captivate people than fear of missing out, right? What everybody who's different than you likes, that's something that's pretty interesting to most people. Or what other people find useful that you've not yet seen, right? This is one of the great strengths of social media that can, in theory, expose us to new and useful things. And I don't think anybody would argue that people viewing Khan Academy videos in rural Afghanistan is anything but a positive, right? But how do we tailor it to produce more of that? Well, we went knocking on the door of Facebook, we went knocking on the door of Twitter, we went knocking on the door of LinkedIn, we knocked on all the doors, and we got a lot of, you know, funny looks. We thought, okay, you know, fair enough, we're sort of asking a lot of you, we'll build it ourselves. And so we created some new civic technology that I'll describe here for a moment. First, we created a bipartisanship leaderboard. So we started to rank people according to how much their posts get likes by people on both sides. We then built bots that people could follow, which would allow you to simulate the bridging-based algorithm in your newsfeed, see what you're missing out on, expose yourself to the things that other people think are important. And we got CNN and the New York Times and a few other high-profile places to boost this. And overnight, we had about 100,000 people use it, which is you know, a pretty good chunk of people. But it's a drop in the water if we're talking about the future of social media. And much as I'd like to tell you that everybody's still using these apps, well, one, Elon Musk broke them, but two, uh, you know, usage dropped off. And so what we need is to embed them inside the platforms, and that's why we were thrilled when Twitter, about a year before Elon Musk, approached us with a problem. Twitter has this wonderful idea to fight misinformation. And the idea is that you could create a community of volunteers from Republican, Democratic, different backgrounds, and you could ask them to crowdsource the detection of misinformation. This would leave the platform without the heavy burden of deciding what should be labeled as misinformation or what should be removed, and it, and it could be outsourced to the crowd. Great idea in principle, if social media were a competition of, of ideas, right, and reasonable arguments rose to the top. But, as I've been trying to convince you all night, they don't. So what do you do? Well, Twitter said, what about this bridging algorithm thing? What if we use this tool to boost the annotations on misinformation by people whose posts are marked as useful or helpful by both Republicans and Democrats? And later that month, we ran a survey experiment where we showed people these labels that were marked as useful to both Republicans and Democrats, and we saw a pretty big effect. People said, yeah, I just, you know, this is probably misinformation. But a survey experiment online doesn't have much external validity. You'd love to see it happen in real life. And so we were even more thrilled when Twitter decided three months later to roll it out onto Birdwatch, which is now called Community Notes, it resulted in a 25 to 35 percent drop in the intention to share misinformation. That is a huge effect by social science standards. And if you're thinking, this guy's crazy, he's got all these Pollyannish ideas about how to fix social media, just be more positive, right? Think about how much content moderation costs Facebook alone. More than $1 billion a year. So if you can create a 25 to 35 percent drop, in the sharing of misinformation, you can reduce your content moderation burden by $300 million. That gets executives listening. What else can we do? Now that we've begun to realize that we don't have to accept the world that 19-year-old college students create, what else, what other, what other possibilities can we imagine when we free ourselves from the paradigm? We thought, what about identity? It's identity that's driving all the vitriol, right? People wanting to win, take down the other side, impress their friends. Could we design an experiment where we take identity out of it? Once again, we go knocking on the doors of Facebook, we go knocking on the doors of Twitter, and we get a lot of funny looks. No, you can't do that. So we built our own social media platform. 
for science. This is something we call the social media accelerator. It's an open source environment designed to allow me and hopefully many of you and your friends who are interested in these issues to design social media platforms and pull the levers inside them and see what happens to human behavior when we do. So in this case, we wanted to test something that could be very sort of scary to do in real life. We wanted to make people anonymous in an experimental condition. Now, you might tell me that's crazy. That guy, Ray, he said all sorts of stuff on Twitter that he would never say in real life, right? And probably many of you have suffered from an anonymous internet troll. I know I have. Um, and that's probably a terrible idea. That's one side of the story. But the other side of the story is that removing identities from the equation might make people focus more on the ideas that people are articulating instead of the identities of the people who are articulating them. And it might give us time to reflect. You know, one of the stories um, that we observed on this platform was an African-American woman whose son was a police officer connecting to a rural conservative man from South Dakota, one of the most bright red parts of our country, um, around the issue of police and violence. Had they known each other's race, had they known each other's status, the conversation I'm fairly certain would have never happened. So which one was it? Does anonymity make polarization worse, or might it lead to more productive debates? And when we rolled this out, we randomized how much information people got about the other person that they were chatting with in a, in a large survey experiment that we designed, and lo and behold, people depolarized. Importantly, Republicans depolarized at four to six times the rate of Democrats, suggesting that maybe all that they need to reconsider their views is to escape the peer pressure from their own side, right? It's not just allowing you to um, you know, take identity out of the equation, it's also helping you avoid your side, which our studies show will punish you dearly if you buck the party line, right? What else can we do? Can we build tools that interact with social media systems if we can't yet convince social media companies to change themselves? Can, create, can we create more of these tools that might help people become more reflective social media users? We used to say we vote with our wallets, with our pocketbooks. I like to say now we vote with our like buttons. We vote with our thumbs, right? When we are engaging with stuff that we don't like, we are in effect saying we want more of this. So we need to educate people, right? It's not just the top down, it's not just the platforms. They deserve a huge amount of blame. But if this is driven by our human instinct to satisfy our own side and to gain status, we need to teach people the consequences of their behavior at the aggregate level. And the last example I'll give is AI. Super polarizing topic right now. Many of us are deeply concerned about so-called generative AI these new tools that can impersonate humans with amazing fidelity, and they may run rampant on social media. In fact, I think they're already running rampant on many social media sites. But how can we counter this? AI may also help us talk to each other more effectively. It may help us become more aware of our biases and train us to talk in the language of the other side. So in an experiment with 1,800 Americans, we had them talk about gun control, and halfway through, we showed one of them a pop-up. And this pop-up was the message they were about to say, rephrased by ChatGPT, in a manner that is consistent with social science evidence about how to de-escalate arguments. They could accept it as is, they could reject it, or they could edit their message. Most people accepted the message, which they were told would help them improve their argument with the other side. We then go and measure whether it actually changed their discussion partner's view of them. Yes, overwhelmingly yes. Conversations were less stressful. They were more enjoyable. Even the quality of the reasons given by people, even though we didn't intervene on their reasons, we just interviewed on the style in which they're communicating, people thought the other side had higher quality arguments as well. And long term and at scale, we think that this type of intervention applied to the large population of debates here, we're looking at gun control, but it could be many other, could continue to reverse the course. 
So if I can just leave you with a few parting thoughts. The common narratives about how to fix social media may be wrong. And right now, in Brussels, in DC, these are all the ideas that are motivating our interventions. And I'm worried that if we follow those, we're not going to fix the problem. We're not going to move the needle. Social media is not a competition of ideas. It's a competition of identities. We need to assume the perspective of social media users and understand their motivation. Once we do that, we can design interventions that aren't beholden to the arbitrary evolution of social media platforms into, quote unquote, democracy's public square. And we can explore how to de-escalate with high quality evidence-based interventions. This will help us reduce the gap between perception and reality, which is currently completely out of whack, thanks to the social media prism. So this will require top-down solutions. You know, we can throw as many stones at platforms as we want. And many other speakers tonight might have told you to get angry. And I will never tell you not to get angry. There's a lot to be angry at social media platforms for. And I think they have done a real disservice to the public sphere, to our ability to communicate to each other. But again, if you think we can go into Facebook and just flip one switch that says polarization on it, I think you're wrong. And I worry that if we tried that, we would underestimate the supply problem, that there's a lot of angry people out there, and that they now have a way to anger each other. So we not only need these top-down interventions, we need bottom-up interventions that re-educate people about how to reverse the course. And maybe, just maybe, public interest technology can help us get there. Now, if you'd like to try these tools, read our research, or learn more about the Duke Polarization Lab, I invite you to check out our website. And for now, thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure to join you this evening. Thank you. Thank you.